This morning, the scripture we're going to focus on has been called the Great Commission. Have any of you ever heard that phrase before? Great Commission? Uh, we're going to focus on this, and uh, as you turn in your scriptures, if you will, to Matthew 28, uh, according to Matthew, these are the last words that came out of Jesus' mouth before he ascended to be with the Father again. It was after his resurrection, remember after he had spent some time with them in his resurrected form, and so this is the way Matthew ends his gospel. Now, if you were writing a gospel, would you think that the very last thing that came out of Jesus' mouth on earth would be important? Probably would, wouldn't you? And you would give special emphasis to that. And that's the way the church has understood these verses these last 2,000 years. So according to Matthew, these are the last things that Jesus said just before he ascended to be with the Father again, starting in Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. This is the word of the Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Let's stop there for just a second. Is it okay to doubt? These 11 folks have walked with Jesus for three and a half years, seen him crucified and resurrected, then got to spend time with him, right, 40 days in his resurrected form. And what does it say? They worshiped him, but some doubted. So that's okay, isn't it? God understands that, and he's able to work with it. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Will you pray with me? God, we need to hear from you, not from me. And so I pray that we might hear you in these moments. Speak to us, O Lord, for your servants are listening, we pray in the name of the Christ. Amen. Two of the last words that came out of Jesus' mouth were, make disciples, wasn't it? Make disciples. Keep that phrase in mind because you're going to hear a lot of it in the next couple of months in particular. In the United States, it is said that mainline Christian churches are suffering from spiritual amnesia. That is to say that if you were to walk in any mainline church in America, that's Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, uh, any of those varieties and flavors, generally if you took a poll of the people there and asked them, why is the church here? You would get a disturbing array of different answers, some of which don't all meld together. The conclusion of those studying churches is, that many of us have forgotten why we're the church or how to be the church. The church has instead become a club or a civic organization. And in fact, when you talk to some of our own members, they will list the church along with the Lions and the Optimists and other such civic organizations that do good works. God never called us to be that, though, did he? He never set us up to be a civic organization. Our churches, it's said, are sick and hemorrhaging because we are disconnected from our Savior and from the mission. And in fact, another term that those who study congregations have come up with is mission drift. The church, especially in America, has drifted from her original mission. And in fact, the amnesia thing says that maybe we don't even remember what our original message or mission was. At Trinity United Methodist Church, it's my opinion, and you've heard me say this before, we are in a critical time of our life together. We're in an important time when the church is struggling to be the church in America, and either we will die like many other churches die. Did you know that the statistics show that in the United States, a United Methodist Church closes depending on which statistics you pay attention to, somewhere between once a day and once a week, a church closes. That's just United Methodist churches. That doesn't include all the other denominations. 
Mainline churches are dying in a hurry. And we're at that place in our life as Trinity United Methodist Church where I'm convinced we will either go that way or we will be risen to new life just like Christ resurrected from the dead. And I know which one of those I'm hoping for. What are you hoping for? How many of you know what revival is? Do you ever pray for revival? Pray that God would bring a renewed thirst among our people. Um, I am grateful that you made worship today an option. Do you know what the latest numbers say about Americans, United States citizens, on a given Sunday? Do more people worship or not worship? On a great Sunday when lots of people are out, that'd be like Christmas, Easter, 42% of Americans worship, which means 58% do not. And on this day, when many of us have gathered in God's house, I don't know about you, but I am so grateful to live someplace that I'm free to worship. I don't have to worry about if they're going to be military police standing outside the door or someone watching me. I am so glad that we live in a place like that. Yet I heard somebody once say, no one is going to come across the ocean, no military, no country is going to come take our freedom of religion away from us. We are lazily going to roll over and give it away. And that's what most are doing this morning, aren't they? They've given up their freedom of religion without anyone ever firing a shot. Out of laziness and complacency, we won't even use, many of us, our freedom of worship. We've been preparing for this in Trinity in a lot of different ways. One of the ways we're saying this is we're trying to rediscover who we are in Christ Jesus. See, the church, when it loses its mission, when it drifts, and we think of it as being like the Lions or the Optimists or some other civic organization, what happens is instead of having our primary mission be the main thing, we instead become a society of mutual admirers. The mission of the church becomes to please the members. When you joined the church, do you remember, did anybody ask you to promise to please the other members of the church? I'll give you a moment to think back. The church in America usually now is much more concerned with pleasing its members than with pleasing God. Shouldn't we give more effort toward pleasing God? Asking God, Lord, is what we're doing what you want? Is that what you're calling us to do? Instead, we're worried about who's going to be upset next to us, aren't we? Or who's going to say what about what? In Trinity, we've been trying to look for this rediscovery and begin to lay the foundations in this way. How many of you remember in 2015, we brought back and resurrected something that had been done here before called every member in ministry. Have you heard that phrase? Please tell me you have. If you haven't, there's every member in ministry brochures in this literature rack right through here. You can fill one out, turn it any time. We ask the members and friends of the church, would you be willing to do something other than be a potted plant on a pew? And would you commit yourself to serving God somehow? And there are literally hundreds of things in that every member of the ministry brochure. We just said, check it if you have an interest. We're not asking you for a commitment. We're not going to ask you to do anything yet. Are you interested in any of this? And I can tell you since 2015 that every member of ministry has been very helpful to us whenever someone needs a ride to go to the doctor, we have a computerized system of pulling up the eight people who said one of the ways that I want to serve God is I will help take an elderly person to the doctor. And we call them and say, would you be willing to help them? Yep. Put them in contact and we connect people for ministry. We started with that in 2015. Last year, in 2016, you may remember a, an emphasis on spiritual gifts. You remember the workshops we did? We did workshops and surveys and learning things about spiritual gifts so that folks could know God gave you something. Um, of all the people you can think about on the in the church or in the planet, how many people has God given no gifts? How many? A zero. Everybody has gifts, right? No matter how small, 
Uh, do you know there are little kids that filled out the Every Member in Ministry brochure? Mom or dad or uncle helped them. And they said, can I turn mine in? Absolutely. Isn't that great that they learn from little on up? You have gifts. You can serve God. At five years old, you can serve God. At four years old, at 104, you can serve God. Spiritual gifts. And so we did that emphasis all through 2016. And in this year and in the year to come, we're going to be putting an emphasis on discipling. A word that is not yet accepted into Oxford's dictionary, but is very common among Christian people. Because we are looking for that uh, discipling model. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this for the next couple of months. In July and August, the sermon series are going to be about our mission, about what God is calling us to do. And in fact, the leaders of this church, along with me, have developed uh, a discipleship model that we hope we can follow. We start at the bottom with number one, worship weekly. Number two is meet monthly. Number three is serve seriously. You say, why do we need a worship or a discipleship model? Here's why. Suppose somebody comes into the church today and says, I never have been following Jesus, but I've heard about him, and I hear his gospel. I want to follow Jesus. Now what do I do? If they ask you that question, what would you tell them? Here's what we're going to suggest. Start them off with number one as a foundation, worship weekly. Notice that it's spelled W-E-E-K, not W-E-A-K. Because that's what a great deal of the church does is worship weekly, like we Melba toast. Worship weekly. How many of you know folks who are allergic to worshiping weekly? If you have children and the children have to ask you on Saturday night, what are we doing tomorrow, you have the wrong model. They should know what we're doing tomorrow, right? We're going to the house of the Lord. But many of our families don't have that. They'll only worship if they don't get a better offer somewhere. Well, none of the sports teams want me and there's no crab festival and uh, Budweiser's not having a boat race. Don't worry, if all that's all, then I guess I can go to church. You see how backwards that is? That's backwards. So what we're going to do in July and August is I'm going to spend the Sundays that I preach unpacking each part of that, to talk about what that means and what it looks like. Because many of you assume that everyone knows how to be a Christian. i got news for you. If you walk in today to the church and say, I've never followed Jesus before, what do I do? There are not too many members of the church who can answer that question. What do I, how do I start? How do I start following Jesus? And we're going to use this as a way of looking at our own lives as well to see how it is that we're doing this and following Jesus. How many of you have heard of Stephen Covey? Author of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There's one quote he had that I want to use this morning. Have you heard this before? He said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. We as the church struggle to keep focused on the main thing, don't we? We have been called out into all kinds of side pursuits and other things, some of them good, some of them not, and we often lose focus. What are we here to do? What is it that God put this church on the earth to do? What did God put you and I on the earth to do? There's a song, I believe, isn't there, we were made to worship? Worship is not something extra. We fit into our schedule. How many of us are lost if you need to miss a week on a Sunday? I don't know about you. I don't know what week it is. I don't know what day it is. I have no idea because the, the rhythm of a Christian life starts with worship. And by the way, we don't give God the tail end of a weekend either, do we? How many of you know which day is the first day of the week on your calendar? Unless you have a heathen business calendar, which some of them have done. First day of the week is Sunday, isn't it? We give him the first day, not the tail end of our weekend when we're exhausted and hungover 
and I'll just look like somebody ran over us with a car and drag ourselves in. This is the first and the best that we give him. This is what we do. At the church, we struggle to keep the main thing the main thing. On the screen you have now, I want to talk for a couple of minutes about the difference between important things and urgent things. Some of you may be sitting there saying, there is no difference in those. What do you mean? Yeah, there is. Let me give you an example. My boss calls me today and says, Jim, I want you to turn this report in by 4 o'clock tomorrow. And if you don't, I'll get rid of you and find somebody who can. That's urgent, isn't it? Because I would like to keep my job. Turn the report in by 4 o'clock tomorrow. Tomorrow, man, this is a holiday week. Shoot. That's urgent. What I was planning to do was my kids have off tomorrow. And I was planning to spend the day with them. Is that urgent or important? That's important, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that sometimes in life, though, the urgent thing takes our attention and the important thing kind of slides by? Does anybody hear what I'm saying? The urgent thing is that thing that flashes at you and says, pay attention, do me now, do me quick, hurry up. My boss saying, if you don't do the report by 4 o'clock tomorrow, you're fired. I'll find somebody who will. That's urgent. Do me now. What's more important? My kids or my boss? I cannot imagine a scenario when I die, can you? I'm on my, I'm on, I'm on my deathbed, ready to go see Jesus face to face, and I can't imagine me saying, you know, Lord, one of the things I'm most grateful for is I got that report in on that Monday, right before the 4th of July. I got that in before 4 o'clock. Lord, that was one of the things I'm most grateful for. Can you imagine me saying such a thing? I can't. But is it possible that I might say as I'm getting ready to go to God, Lord, I want to thank you for my children, for my son and my daughter. I thank you for every moment I had with them. I thank you for every day that I got to play with them. I thank you, Lord, for every meal we got to have together. I thank you for their mother. See the difference between urgent and important. Urgent flashes. How many of you in your car know what an idiot light is? You know what an idiot light is? It's usually that little thing that comes on and normally it says engine. And the people who call them idiot lights are mechanics. Because many of them say that when that comes on, several idiots come in and we get to charge them $500 to turn it off. Now, by the way, if your engine light comes on, I would like to suggest it might be good to, I don't know, sashay by your mechanic and find out what that is. Because sometimes it is something serious, isn't it? Oftentimes it's not. But there are lots of mechanical businesses uh, that based on the urgency of the idiot light. Somebody in the 930 service this morning said, well, I took care of that. I just have a piece of tape. I put on that thing, and whenever it comes on, I put the tape over it. I said, remind me not to drive with you, because I don't want to end up on the side of Route 4 on the 4th of July saying Sunday school words to that light. See, often in life, what grabs us is the urgent, isn't it? And we often miss or ignore or underappreciate the important. The important is still there and just slides by us. Look again at what Jesus said was important. In fact, would you mind reading this out loud with me, please? Off the screen, let's read together. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is very brief, but boy, there's a lot of good stuff in there, isn't there? How many of you have claimed the last sentence where Jesus said, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Have you ever claimed that? 
Say, Lord, I, I'm in trouble. Lord, I'm distressed. Lord, I need you. Remember you promised that you would always be with me to the end of the age. There's stuff in there about baptizing and teaching the sacraments and Christian education. But the words I want us to focus on are the words that are now in blue. Making disciples. Over the next couple of months, we're going to try and refocus the church on that primary task of discipling, of making disciples. We're going to do our best to make the main thing the main thing. And for us, what did Jesus say the main thing is? Making disciples. Now, does that have other aspects to it? Education, teaching, preaching, uh, baptizing, serving the poor? Yes, it does, but it's all directed toward what? Making disciples. In a few moments, we're about to share a supper together. We're going to share a meal. And I have been fortunate enough to have a good education that folks have given me. And so I have studied for years in vaunted halls of learning. Um, is the bread actually the body of Jesus or is it a symbol? Um, what's in the cup? Is it actually the blood of Jesus or is it a symbol? Was Robert Zwingli right that it's all symbolic or are our Roman Catholic sisters and brothers right that it's literally the body and the blood of Jesus or the Baptists who are somewhere in the middle and not sure they care? I've been privileged to have that education and know all that. But you know what? I have celebrated the sacrament of the Lord's Supper at least hundreds of times. <coughs> I don't remember ever somebody coming up and saying, now, before I eat this bread, was Robert Zwingli right? Who cares, right? By the way, Google it. If you think I'm making that up, there actually is a dude named Robert Zwingli, and he did a lot about this. What's the main thing? What's the most important part of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? Jesus said, this is my body that's broken for you. This is my blood that's shed for you. What's the main part of that? What's the most important part? I had a family one time, and I'd noticed that they did not bring their children for the Lord's Supper. And so I asked them one time, I said, not to be nosy, but I notice you all are faithful, but you never bring your children to the Lord's table. Would you mind if I ask you why? And she said, because the children don't yet understand communion completely. I said, lady, if I only served communion to those who understood it completely, I might serve three people a week, but I doubt it. There are times when I don't understand completely what's going on. Do you? Do we only baptize people who completely understand? No, we make them wet and hope they'll figure it out. Are there ever things in the faith you don't understand, but you keep taking a step forward and you keep walking? This mysterious supper that we will share in just a moment is part of the discipling of people. And two other words that he said, follow me. Are you ever at a place in your life where you really wonder if you're doing the right thing? Even when you're trying your best, do you still wonder sometimes? I'm not really sure. Jesus said, follow me. And even if we get off on the wrong road, what will he do? He'll bring us back, won't he? He'll redirect us. He'll wait for us to go off, and then he'll come back and bring us back to him. Pray with me, if you will. Lord, help us to stay in that main thing. As you are discipling us, O oh God, help us to cause the church to make disciples as well. And as we look to follow you, Lord, put our feet in your footsteps. Where we are in error, correct us. Where we are hurt, heal us. Where we lack, love us. For we depend only on you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.